Welcome to the Cold Case Christianity Broadcast, the only Christian case-making program hosted by a cold case homicide detective. Jay Warner Wallace has been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Court TV, and Dateline. For more information about Jim's work and the case for Christianity, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. Now, here's your host, Jay Warner Wallace. Thanks for joining us at Cold Case Christianity. I'm Jay Warner Wallace. Uh, if you might have been watching over the last couple of weeks, you know we've been kind of uh, going through some older shows because I've been on a crazy speaking schedule for five weeks where I didn't have really a chance to even breathe, it felt like. And I kind of lost my voice over that period of time. But finally, we're back here in front of the cameras to do a couple of new episodes for you here at Cold Case Christianity. And you know, for years, I had a podcast. Eight years we did this podcast. We had a great weekly um, uh, listenership, and we still do. As a matter of fact, we create this show each week, and we produce it both as the 30-minute video, which you see here at NRB TV, and as the 30-minute podcast, which people still subscribe to. And uh, it's been great fun to be able to do that. And I mention this because back when I had just the podcast, about every month or so, uh, maybe six weeks or so, I would go back and read list listener email. I must tell you, when I started, I was still working full-time as a detective. I still had a caseload. I still um, tried to squeeze in uh, the writing and publishing and um, and doing podcasts uh, on the side, uh, late at night, early in the morning before I go to work. It was a crazy time. And uh, But when I started, I didn't have a huge audience. And I was able to answer listener email that people would st- send to me directly. Uh, of course, as time went by, it became more and more difficult to answer the listener email. As a matter of fact, I have not done a podcast in which I answer listener email for some time. So today I thought we'd do something old school. You'll notice the screen is not with me today. We're just back here in the office. And we are just going to do a show, a couple of shows, maybe three, in which I catch up on some of the listener email. Because I must tell you, um, when I started originally, I was so happy that people were listening and I was able to really give a personal touch and respond to people who asked questions. And as I've gotten bombed now with hundreds and hundreds of requests, I just don't have the ability to do it anymore. And I don't have a staff. You know, we're not a 501c3. We're not, we're not a nonprofit. Uh, it, we don't have any uh, income that we actually turn into staff. That's just not how we, how we operate. So it's really about one person trying to paddle harder and harder as the uh, tide gets a little more and more. Uh, the current gets a little harder as well. Now, I can tell you that it used to be I had a place to actually link to to ask questions on our website. We, we had to shut that down. I got so many questions. Um, the people who typically send me questions now are people who do it on social media, either through on my author page uh, on Facebook or through Twitter or through Instagram, or they are people who subscribe to the daily um, email. We have a daily email that we send out, which gives you the whatever that day's uh, um, podcast or video or article is, you get that in your inbox uh, five days a week. And we've been doing that for several years. We have a huge list of people who get those. And those are the folks who simply hit reply to the email that comes to them. And they'll shoot me a question. And so I've started to collect some of these. Occasionally, I would try to write a blog or do something with those to help people get the answers they need. I certainly would try to send links to some of the articles we've written. But today, on today's show, we're going to do an old school show on uh, answering email. Now we're going to try to answer two or three in the time span we have. And I've discovered over the years that answering listener email has become one of the most popular things we ever did on the podcast. And I bet you might feel the same way once we get done with these shows. Because you probably have some of these questions yourself or know somebody who does, and you finally get a chance to hear them uh, voiced. Now I'm going to put them on the screen as well, so you'll have them. I'm going to read them from my monitor, and you'll have a chance to see what the listener said or what it was asked, and then we'll try to respond to it, okay? That being said, let's get to today's first question. And I'm, I got this question, uh, actually, you know, that's not really a question, it's a comment. that I, I, It's very similar to some of the questions I get online. This comment was made on Amazon. Uh, when, you, when you write a book, uh, people can actually review the book, and they can make comments about the book. And sure enough, this uh, b- purchaser of the book read it, and as a Christian, he had a problem with it. 
And so he posted the following statement on the Amazon page. Now you'll see some dots here that kind of connect the sentences, but those aren't my dots. I'm not taking anything out of his original statement. This is exactly as he wrote it to me. So here it is. This is another example, this meaning the, the book, uh, Cold Case Christianity, is another example of tyranny of the experts. I'm glad this author found his salvation, but he has trouble attributing to 2 Timothy 3.16, the quote here, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Additionally, he does not credit Christ's church with the protection of God's word. Sad. Let's come back and think about this for a second. Let me tell you what I think he's complaining about because I hear something similar to this often. Cold Case Christianity, the book, and this show, if you've been watching it, or this podcast, if you've been listening to it, really takes the time to make a case for why you should trust Scripture. Why we know, evidentially, it's been handed down to us over the centuries and protected well enough for us to be able to return reliably to the inerrant original. I'd make a case for this in cold case Christianity. I make a case for why the resurrection is the most reasonable inference from evidence. We do a lot of, of, of uh, evidential work in that book and in a book called God's Crime Scene where we're making a case for the reliability of Scripture, the truth of the Christian worldview, and the existence of God in those two books. Okay. I often, after doing such a thing as that, We'll get email from people or this kind of a comment. This is like a two-star review, right? They didn't like the book because the argument here as a believer is you, Mr. Christian, Jim Wallace, you ought to trust that the scripture has been handed to you because the scripture says you ought to trust it. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And the complaint here, as you heard in the, uh, and I'm on the screen again for you here, is that I did not credit Christ's church with the protection of God's word. Well, two things about this. I want to answer it because I understand the objection for sure. There's this sense that we, are we really, are we, are we kind of slapping God in the face when we don't simply trust what his word says about his word? And I remember my journey into Christianity as an atheist was through the template of my own family. And my family was equally divided between atheists and Mormons. Mormons believe the Book of Mormon is true. And they basically they base their belief in large part on their writing they find in the Book of Mormon. So I remember my, my entry into Christianity is through this process, surrounded by people who would say, just you just need to read the Book of Mormon, pray about it, and you will have an experience that affirms that this is true for you. This is true that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, and the Book of Mormon is true. In other words, if, if the only claim is going to be that I should trust what the Scripture tells me about the Scripture, then why shouldn't I trust what the Mormon Scripture tells me about the Mormon Scripture? If I'm trying to decide if one or both of these systems is true or false, and I did this simultaneously, looking at both the Old and New Testament, the Book of Mormon, Doctrines and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price. Those are the Mormon scriptures. The question then becomes, how do I determine if any of this is true or if one of these two things is true and one is false? Do I not at that point have to go beyond the claims of each set of scriptures to see if there's anything outside the claims of the scriptures that, that tells us it's true? And by the way, this is not a slap in God's face. This is exactly what Jesus did in front of his disciples. He would repeatedly, and read the Gospel of John, would say, if you don't believe what I'm telling you, at least believe on the evidence of the miracles I've worked in front of you. If you don't believe my words, if you need them to be somehow affirmed or confirmed or corroborated for you, you have the corroboration of my miracles. Wow. As a matter of fact, when tested to see how he would respond to doubt that's offered by John the Baptist. We've talked about this on the show before. John sends his disciples to Jesus. Jesus, uh, John's disciples say, hey, John's suffering right now. He's in prison and he wants to know, are you the one? Jesus right there has the opportunity to tell him about, to tell these disciples about the basis of their belief. Why should John continue to believe that Jesus is the one? What process ought they use to convince John? How should John's he could have easily said, hey, you need to go back to the Old Testament Scripture and know that the Scripture is, is protected by God and has predicted me. No, here's what he does. 
He does three miracles in front of John's disciples and says, go back and tell John what you just saw. That is corroborative evidence. If you don't believe what I've said to you already, if you don't believe what you've already seen, I'll do it again. Now go tell John, I did it again. That's a very evidential approach. So I think that this is something that, that I, I found very comforting as a, a skeptic who was coming to the scriptures, that this is what the, the master, this is what Jesus of Nazareth, this is how he, he actually worked in front of his audiences, in front of his disciples, in front of John's disciples. Now, the other thing that's made uh, mention in this complaint is that I did not credit Christ's church with the protection of God's word. But actually, I did do that because if you've looked at cold case Christianity, one of the chief questions we have to ask is, number one, has the word, has the uh, testimony of the ancients, of the disciples who saw Jesus, has it changed over time? And we know that it wasn't changed over time because the testimony as it was given from John to his students, Ignatius, Polycarp, and Papias, to their student, Irenaeus, to his student, Hippolytus, we have the early church protecting the eyewitness statements by writing about what these eyewitnesses said and by transmitting what they said to their own students. So in fact, the church has, and I demonstrate this in an entire chapter in the book. So number one, I, I do... Uh, uh, understand the importance of statements in Scripture which testify to both the truthfulness, the use usefulness, and the divine nature of Scripture. But everyone's Scripture has some statement like that. So we have to decide. Are we just going to trust these documents then? Then how do I even begin to argue? How do I even begin to dis differentiate between me and my Mormon family? And two, I have used the actual history of the church, the early church, to make a case for the reliability of the New Testament. So I tried to, to answer that both ways. Anyway, that's the answer to my first question, listener email. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll go to question number two. Be sure to visit the Cold Case Christianity website daily to read Jim's blog, watch the weekly video, or listen to the Cold Case Christianity podcast. You'll also find great free resources, including the free downloadable monthly Bible insert. While you're there, be sure to sign up for Jim's daily case note email. Cold Case Christianity is designed to help you become a better Christian case maker. Okay, this question might take a little bit of time. Hopefully we'll be able to get through it and get to a third question this week. But uh, this is a statement that's made, uh, sent to me on email when I sent out an article earlier this month about uh, why I don't fret over uh, Genesis 1, why I don't get into panic over all the different interpretations available to us about Genesis 1. Now, that's I know when I write something like that, that's going to be a controversial post because Christendom, all of us as Christians, are we, we kind of like to divide and, and separate uh, from one another based on what we think the age of the earth is. There are young earth six-day creationists. There are uh, ancient earth creationists who believe that there's a longer period of time. And by the way, that has been the case since antiquity. Uh, Augustine was somebody who, who was not quite committed to a young earth paradigm. He was an ancient earther because he saw in Psalms that to God a day is like a thousand years. So he's trying to figure out in Genesis 1, is that one of God's days or is that one of our days? So I'm just here to tell you that the church has been divided over Genesis 1 for some time. And, and this is still dividing us, right? And so I wrote an article where I kind of offered why this doesn't bug me. Uh, there's a great book by John Lennox called Seven Days That Divide the World in which he kind of offers a, a brief summary of the many ways that, uh, six or seven ways, that um, the church has interpreted Genesis 1. And there's a variety of ways. It's really an interesting book. I, I, would, I would commend it to you to read. And, and so there are a number of ways, classically, traditionally, that Christians have tried to interpret Genesis 1. And the reason why I don't get panicky over it is because I've had many cases where we tried to figure out how did the guy do it? How did this crime occur? And we had a theory. I had a theory which seemed reasonable given the evidence. And my partner had a different theory which also had some reasonable uh, strengths to it, right? Based on the evidence in the room. And it turns out when the guy finally confesses, we were both wrong. Well, the whole point is that when you've got a case where you've got a guy involved as a suspect, and, and you've got a number of ways that you could explain how he did it. Well, that's a good case. Now, you may not know which of those ways he did it, but the fact that he's not alibied because he was in France on the day of the murder means that he's not excluded. 
He's still in as a suspect. You're just not sure how he did it. Same thing's happening here. We've got a number of theories about how to interpret Genesis 1, all of which go to some, uh, go to some, some length to, to explain the evidence. Great. I'm, I'm actually comforted by that, the fact that we have a number of alternative explanations. I would be more concerned if our uh, narrative for our ancient narrative of creation was that uh, the entire universe was belched out of the belly of a whale or the belly of a turtle or, like, or some of the crazy things we see in ancient cosmologies. We don't have that kind of claim. The fact that we're divided about how exactly, precisely to, uh, to kind of parse through that narrative in Genesis 1 does not concern me. And if you think, look, look the way to, 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 to read this is X, and somebody else says the way to read this is Y, I want, us to, I want to be in both camps with you. Because I don't see this as an essential that you see in any creed of Christendom that we have to agree on, the, on how we interpret Genesis 1. This is something we can be, we can be, are free to disagree about. And so you're going to have to land this for yourself. I just hope that as you land it, you land it on the basis of how well your explanation interprets the evidence, how well it accounts for the evidence. Don't just take an assumption without seeing how it measures up against the evidence. You have to kind of weigh these two things. It's this balance between natural revolution, uh, uh, revelation and special revelation. So I respect both camps that are very much fighting with each other over this issue. I would be more concerned if there was no way to reconcile the narrative. It turns out there are a number of ways to reconcile the narrative. That gives me some confidence. Now, let's go to the comment that was made, though. I got this email. Here's what it says. After getting the, uh, the, um, the uh, article in the, his an inbox, he wrote this. Imagine how pathetically desperate this must sound to a non-believer. You can't get past the first two verses of the Bible without running into insurmountable interpretive difficulties. Any logical person would ask, why get involved with such a uh, perilous text at all? And how can you possibly sort out doctrinal clarity if you cannot even manage verses 1 and 2? Pathetic. Okay, a couple of things are being overstated here, though. Number one, these are not insurmountable difficulties. They are several, they're simply differences in interpretation. And the fact that we have a document that we must take time at places to do our best to interpret does not invalidate the document. We are doing this every day in America with our Constitution. When in trial settings at the Supreme Court level, we are trying to interpret the clearest meaning of the Constitution based on the Founding Fathers, however you interpret uh, the Constitution. If you, this is all about us taking an area of law and making a case on either side. We don't just take and say, well, forget it. We can't even have a, our Constitution is a joke. If you can't get past the first two issues in the Constitution without running into insurmountable interpretive difficulties, well, we would say, number one, they aren't insurmountable. And number two, this is the nature of documents written uh, that we uh, find as found, we hold as foundational. And we want, if we want to be true to the document, we're going to have to kind of work through what we think the original authors meant when they penned it. That's an important exercise, actually. And that's a worthy exercise. And I don't think that that exercise invalidates the document. This is true for the Constitution. It's also true for us with the Bible. We have to try to figure out what did the original author intend in that passage? Why did he write it? What genre of literature is it? What is he trying to accomplish with it? We don't want to miss the point of the person who's making the case to us in Scripture. And so that's exactly what we do here, is we take a look at it. Now, if you say, how can we possibly sort out doctrinal clarity if you can't even manage verses 1 and 2? Well, that is simply because there are places in the Scripture that are meant to be very clear, and they are clear. And we know they're clear, and we don't have arguments about those areas. And there are areas that are gray. The difficulty we come into is when we try to make the gray areas black and white. So I think like any level of communication, there are areas that are left for interpretation. There are areas that are not essential and there are areas, uh, there are places in the scripture that are essential. This is true of any foundational worldview, any foundational doctrine, any foundational document. So even if you were to hold a view as an atheist, 
Atheists disagree about a lot of non-essentials. They would say they are non-essentials. They agree on an essential claim, there is no God. But they parse out the explanations differently. Turns out all of us do that. And this is not a reason to abandon your worldview. I wouldn't say because of the, 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 the arguments that are being made, say, for example, on the problem of mind and consciousness by atheists, that they should have, that's the reason alone they should abandon their worldview. You know, that's not how, we, how, how it works. Is it an essential? Now, I would say that those kinds of issues may become essential. And if you think this is an essential issue, then it's worth having the discussion. Now, I just don't see it historically being an essential issue. Uh, it certainly hasn't been historically in any creed of Christendom. So anyway, that's where I fall on this. And I don't think that the fact that we have disagreements about any passage of the document means the document is no longer valid. Any more than I think that our disagreements about how the Constitution ought to be interpreted means the Constitution is invalid. Hope that helps you think through that. We'll take a quick break. I think we have, might have time to squeak in one more. Okay, let's try to answer one more. We have about five minutes. I think we can do it. So, so here is the, uh, the, the uh, message as it was sent to me. I've edited it a little bit so you'll see the dot, 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 uh, so you can kind of get a sense of, um, of what he's... Uh, it's a larger email message, so I have to kind of edit it for you. Here it is. I'm still having a hard time in my walk toward faith. I think I'm getting there, but I'm sort of the engineer type. That is, just used to requiring absolute proof of everything, I believe. I'm not giving up. I will keep studying and reading and thinking. I think sometimes I had a distinct advantage uh, coming to this worldview, coming to the examination of Christianity, um, after having experience as an investigator, after having experience as a um, detective who knew what the standard of proof was. And I've said it here before, the standard of proof in criminal trials, and the highest standard of proof available to us in any trial, is the, the standard of proof we use in murder cases. And it is beyond a reasonable doubt. It is not beyond a possible doubt. And it's, that, it's set that way for a reason. You, you could never convince anybody of anything if the standard of proof is beyond a possible doubt. Because think about it. I don't care how certain you are about a, a particular issue. I can find some way to cause you to doubt with a possible doubt. You know, it's possible that you're imagining the whole thing. It's possible that you, you're imagining this podcast or you're imagining this broadcast. You're dreaming it right now. I mean, there's, there's always some level of crazy possible doubt. But what really matters is whether or not those possible doubts are reasonable. Here's my point. When someone says, I'm the sort of person who has to have absolute proof before I believe something, well, we ask that question of jurors, right? We'll ask the question almost exactly like that. Are you the kind of person who has to be 100% sure, can't have any open questions, can't have any remaining doubt before you can make a decision? There are jurors who will say, yeah, that's who I am. And if they say that, we say, well, thank you, and you're excused. Because you can't serve on a jury if that's the way you think about things. Because it turns out that you don't have that kind of certainty about anything in your life. You think that you have to have absolute proof, but absolute proof means absolute. No remaining doubt, no issue could come up. Everything that could be known about this thing you're examining is known, and you know it. Think about that. You don't have that kind of certainty about anything. We have concepts that we think are solid, uh, like the, uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity, the general theory of relativity. Think about it. That's a pretty well-accepted theory, and it seems to be weighing out more and more again. The more we measure it, the more we have evidence that comes in, even in the last two or three months, it seems to affirm this theory. I got it, but there's still a lot. I mean, I think that most scientists would say they can imagine a scenario in which this might not be true, if we discover some other kind of evidence. So although we, we work as though it's true, we apply it as a template and it seems to solve lots of problems and it seems to give us good information, we can't be absolutely sure. We're just sure enough. We have a level of certainty that we think has given us confidence to move forward. That's true for everyone in every worldview, regardless of who you are. That's true for me in other areas of my life I don't have absolute certainty about anything. You can't be certain you're gonna go start your car tomorrow morning and it's not gonna blow up in your driveway. But you think you've got, you know, 99.999, I get it. But it's not absolute, that's my point. So the real question is, when is enough enough? 
And, and I'll tell you, jurors ask that question of us. You know, when do we think we're going to be at reasonable beyond a reasonable doubt? I mean, how do I know if I'm there? You'll say to yourself, you know, I hear people say this, um, he sure looks guilty to me, but I, how do I know if I've met the standard? Well, the real question is, is how reasonable are the doubts you have left? We all have possible doubts. If you write your doubts on a whiteboard and you were to actually look at those doubts, are those doubts just kind of your own emotional response? Or are they just doubts that you, you thought you have, what if kind of thoughts? We tell jurors all the time, if all you have are what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, we're looking for doubts that are grounded in good evidence. Those are called reasonable doubts. And it's, cl it's clear, I, I took six months looking at the Christian worldview before I was willing to commit to it. Six months, and I spent hours each day, my days off were like just, I was obsessed. And the reason why I was obsessed is because I had to get to a level where I knew I had enough is enough. And I had to reach that level. Now, how do you know? Because all the substantive doubts I had, I walked through them all. I worked through them all. And as a result, I realized those were just possible doubts. Those weren't really reasonable in light of the evidence. And so I was able to separate possible doubt from reasonable doubt and jump in because I knew I had enough, enough reason to believe it's true. That's where we have to be, uh, be comfortable. And if you are the kind of person that says, I could never jump into any theistic worldview, Christianity or any other one, because I need absolute certainty, I would just challenge you to think if you really need absolute certainty about anything else. What you really need is to be beyond a reasonable doubt. I get that. Now the question is, do you have enough evidence to be beyond a reasonable doubt when it comes to Christianity? And I would su submit that you do. And that's why I try to make a case for this in Cold Case Christianity and in God's Crime Scene. And I hope those tools have been valuable to you. That's it for this week, folks. I hope you've enjoyed it. We've answered a few questions. We'll do that again next week right here at Cold Case Christianity. Thanks for joining us at the Cold Case Christianity broadcast. If you're interested in more information about this week's topic, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For a thorough investigation of the reliability of the New Testament Gospels and the case for Christianity, be sure to purchase Cold Case Christianity. A homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels. It's available wherever books are sold.